Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today. Ah, wow, it's November 4th, 2019. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brains. Thank you so much for the, I think it was bits. I'm not seeing it in my chat. I've, I've worked on adjusting my setup so that I can better see the screen over there, but it's still, it turns out just outside of my ability to see. It was a sub. Thank you so much for the sub. Um, so, so, uh, the chat is already asking, so how about that pad abort? So for those of you who weren't following Twitter and the news this morning, Boeing's Starliner did a abort test out in White Sands, New Mexico. This was where they were practicing to see just what would happen if things went terribly wrong and they had to abort the capsule off of a future well, commercial crew flight to the International Space Station. And um, fascinatingly, they're saying everything went A-OK, -okay, even though there were only um, two out of the three parachutes deployed. We are all kind of perplexed by this, but at the same time, I guess it makes sense that they're essentially saying, hey, they would have landed fine because you only need to parachutes to survive. Um, but I think all of us would have felt a little bit better if all three parachutes had deployed. We are still in the early hours after the support test, and there will be more information on this on Wednesday when Annie Wilson is here to do her Wednesday rocket update. For today, well, it's kind of hitting that slow news season. November, well, for just about everyone is when, well, things kind of quiet down. Now, the reason that they quiet down in astronomy is a little bit different than, well, your day-to-day -day experience. I know with my husband's job, things are slowing down because people are starting to plan their vacations, planning their end of year, and, well, it's the holiday season. Well, in astronomy, it's also the grants and conference and midterms and, oh my God, how do we get everything done season. So right now, there are faculty all over the world who are giving their students exams and realizing I have to grade them. There are, well, people like me writing grants frantically that are due on the November 15th deadline. And on top of all of this, we are getting ready for the American Geophysical Union uh, meeting in December and the American Astronomical Society meeting in January. I will be at the latter, but not the former. So you can, um, well, you'll get lots of live coverage of AAS in January. Um, all of this means I got up this morning to know real science news and there wasn't any over the weekend. And so what we're going to do is the promised deep dive into the geology of Pluto that we had talked about doing last week. Now, Pluto is, is one of these worlds that we don't know nearly as much about as we would like. We can barely see it from, and by this I mean we can barely resolve any color differences on it from here at the planet Earth. And when New Horizons flew past it back in 2015, it was traveling 36,000 miles per hour. And at that velocity, it could only see one side of the world as it zoomed past, or rather it could only see one side of the world in the high resolutions that you see in this image. At its closest approach, New Horizons was able to, and here I have to look at my notes, it was able to resolve Pluto at an amazing um, 80 meters per pixel. Now 80 meters per pixel means you can make out football fields, no big deal. Now, unfortunately, Pluto has a rotation rate of 6.4 Earth days. And uh, 
while Pluto imaged and imaged, imaged, Pl while New Horizons imaged and imaged and imaged Pluto on its approach to this former planet, it uh, could only see what we now refer to as the far side of Pluto at a great distance. So the side that we see at the highest resolution is in the literature referred to as the near side from the perspective of New Horizons. And the other side, which we talked about last week, is referred to as the far side. And on the far side, we unfortunately only see some of the regions with resolutions of, um, well, more like 5 to 30 kilometers per pixel. And that's kind of frustrating. 30 kilometers per pixel is actually what we expect to be able to get in perfect circumstances with the 30 meter class telescopes that are in the process of being built and that should begin to come online in the next decade. So we don't have the kind of data that we would like for all of Pluto. And in order to help us fill in future understandings, NASA has now funded um, an ex exploration of what would it take to put an orbiter in place at the distance of Pluto. This isn't something that you should get excited about. Best case with everything funded as rapidly as possible, such a mission is still 20 years in our future. It's the Southwest Research Institute that was commissioned to put together this study for NASA. And the Southwest Research Institute is where most of the New Horizons team is located. And as they look toward the future, they're looking at a multi-generational team recognizing that the folks that were responsible for New Horizons are hopefully going to still be around, but are also hopefully going to be retired for many of them by the time any future orbiter is able to reach Pluto. So as we consider that future, it's good to look and see, well, what is it that we've come to understand about this world? Now, prior to actually flying to Pluto, we expected to find a cold gray world that was geologically dead and showed no signs of really ever having any geologic activity. We were expecting to find something that was extraordinarily cratered. In many ways, what we were really expecting was something that resembled Jupiter's moon Ganymede or Ceres, but less active. What we actually found is an extremely dynamic world that has required entirely new ways of, well, thinking to figure out what's going on. And in looking at this, let's start by looking at the near side of Pluto. That's the far side. Let's start by looking at the near side of Pluto. I'm going to see if I can enlarge this image any. Um, pardon me while I struggle for a moment to embiggen things behind my shoulder. Um, this is not working the way I would anticipate. That is deeply confusing. Hold on. Ah, this is what happens when you try to do something fancy. The computer says, no, I will not let you. There we go. Okay, so, so what I was saying is, is here we have the near side of Pluto. And what we have here is a heart-shaped feature that we now refer to as Sputnik Planum. This is the heart of Pluto. And it's thought that this massive feature is actually a massive impact basin, an asymmetric impact basin. And it's the shape that is so important. Now, you may have heard me and many others say over and over that in general, craters are always round. And the reason they're round is they're formed through all the kinetic energy of an impacting object getting transformed into the shock wave that radiates away from the point of impact and as it radiates away creates this round crater 
it's not round because of the impact itself. It's round from that shock wave of energy. Now, this is only true when the impact occurs for angles that are 30 degrees above the horizon and greater. And in some cases, you can actually get even flatter impacts. So what I mean is if something comes in like this and like this, at most angles that it comes in, you're going to get that completely round impact. But if it comes in at less than 30 degrees, that is when you're going to get an asymmetric impact. Uh, on the moon, we have this for the South Aitken Basin, not that we can generally see the entire South Aitken Basin, but if you could, it would be asymmetric. Uh, with Sputnik Planum, it's quite possible that as whatever created this, this impact region came in, what occurred uh, was essentially a snow plowing of debris that then flew forward, making that asymmetry that we see as this heart shape today. Now, it's, it's actually somewhat confusing to figure out, did it plow uh, from the bottom upwards, from the top downwards? And there's different models that lead to both of these different understandings. But what's kind of cool is however Sputnik Planum was formed, on the exact opposite side of Pluto, there are these ridges. I'm still learning to green screen. Thank you for your patience. There are these ridges that occur on the exact opposite side of the world. And when you have a big enough basin formed, shock waves can travel all the way around the world and pool their energy on the other side of the planet, creating geologic features. You can also end up with the material that was flung up during the impact event getting flung all the way around the world. In both cases, you end up with something weird on the other side of the planet. And with Pluto, we see at very terrible resolutions, which is why we need another mission. We see these features on the opposite side of the planet. Now, Sputnik Planum isn't one of the oldest features on Pluto. And in fact, its existence may be responsible for the orientation that we see of Pluto today, which probably isn't the orientation that Pluto has always had. Pluto actually has, and you can't really see them well in this image, these massive wrinkle ridges that go around it in an orientation, and here I want to make sure I have my orientation notes correct. Um, pardon me while I flip open my notes. So they cut like this across the world. So not quite through the current pole, there are these wrinkle ridges. And these ridges, which are referred to as the Great North-South Ridge Trough System, are geologically driven. They're tectonic features, but they're not tectonic features like we have here on Earth. They're not driven by plates that are moving around. Instead, with this world that is largely water ice, not entirely, not majority, but it has a fair amount of water ice, it's possible that these tectonic features were created as the freezing world expanded and you ended up with these essentially crunch zones coming out. And that's just literally cool. It is cool temperatures and also like cool to think about, but it is only possible because of the extreme temperatures of this ex extremely cold world. Now, in other really interesting features, you may have noticed there are, and here I'm trying to get my cursor over, there are these dark mottled regions. And these dark mottled regions are on both sides of Pluto. So here in this map that stretches behind me, 
you can see the modeled regions are at a constant latitude all the way around Pluto, only interrupted by Sput Sputnik Planum. Oh, I forgot to say something about those ridge, ridge, those ridge trough systems. The ridge trough systems that were probably formed through the expansion of freezing ice, that's actually what they refer to as the paleo equator of Pluto. This means that once upon a time, it was a ridge like this across Pluto that was originally its equator. Now, exactly how Pluto went from having that as its equator to much later on in its history, having a heart and having its current orientation is a matter of debate. It could be that this occurred after the impact changed the mass distribution of Pluto and the world resettled, getting tidally locked into its current position due to its relationship with its moon Charon or its co-dwarf planet Charon. Um, however the pole wandered to where it is today, it appears that the pole used to be very different and that this used to be the equator instead of this being the equator. Now, this dark modeled region and the fact that it's where it is actually tells us something about the importance of Pluto's day-night cycle. Now, Pluto is tilted. It um, does have seasons. It also gets closer and further from the sun, which for Pluto, that actually is going to dominate its seasons rather than its tilt. But that tilt means that there are only certain regions of, of Pluto that always have a day-night cycle. There are other regions that experience constant day and other regions that experience constant night during their winters and summers. The same way the Arctic and Antarctic here on Earth have the midnight sun during their summer and nothing but night during their winter. That always has day-night cycle section, happens to also be this dark mottled section. And one of the theories for how this dark mottled section got to be is it, it hasn't allowed any of the bright crystals to settle there, where instead they, they are dynamically moved to settle on other parts of this world. And so you have the, the hot section, um, or rather the section that always has day-night, um, thermally is able to simply reject bright materials and send them to settle in other places. Now, one of the other really cool features to exist on Pluto, and here I'm making sure I don't lie to you about the location, so pardon while I scroll through my notes. Um, so the, let me switch over to the, this map. So these, trying really hard to color match these red sections that you see. So these red sections, well, I'm reaching out of my green screen region. Um, the red that you see in this image, these are areas that have much higher elevations and they also have something called bladed terrain. And this is one of the coolest things in, in terms of uh, dynamically formed terrain that isn't created through geologic uplift or anything. So these regions are higher elevation. And they also have methane blades on them. And when I use the word blade, I'm actually referring to these massive, essentially blades of methane ice rising up 
from the soil. And the soil is the wrong word, rising up from the regular surface of Pluto. And this belated train is something that we have in the highest altitude regions of Chile, where it's extraordinarily dry, but there is old snow up there. And over time, some of the snow converts directly from snow to water ice through a sublimation, not water ice, to um, moisture through a sublimation process. And so instead of melting into water, it simply goes into the air, sublimating away. And as this occurs, it leaves behind these weird bladed features that we see in Chile. Now, it's thought that these weird, extraordinarily larger features that we see on Pluto, where the gravity is lower and the temperatures are colder, that these extraordinarily larger features that we see on Pluto are methane ice that over the fullness of time has been able to partially sublimate, leaving behind what looks like massive blades rising up from the surface. So we have all these crazy geologic features. In, in addition to what I've already discussed, there are glaciers, there are uh, two craters that appear to be excavated one way, having bright soil, not soil, bright surface material on the floor and massive mountains in the center. There's one on the far side, one on the near side. Um, you can see it outlined in green in this image. Uh, let me see if I can point out. I can't point out the one on the near side. My vision just isn't quite that good. I think it's right about there. Um, both of these similarly sized craters have similar geology, indicating that at that latitude all the way around Pluto, you have similar chemical structures, molecular structures to the, to the ices. Uh, there are similarly sized craters that are radically different at other latitudes, showing that there's latitude-based differences in the chemistry. This is a cool blob of ice. And it's important to remember, this is a blob of ice. If you took Pluto and you brought it into the inner solar system, it would behave like a comet. And so what we're looking at when we look at Pluto is the way a variety of different ices interact with each other in different thermodynamic systems. So a lot of what we see on Pluto, we can actually, well, at much smaller scales, recreate in freezers here on Earth which is cool to think about. Um, this is a completely different form of geology than what we deal with when we try and figure out the thermodynamics of rocks, the bonding, the tensile strength. This is ice, this is hydrodynamics, this is chemistry. And it's overall, well, something that maybe in 20 years we'll have an orbiter going back to visit. But until then, what we can look forward to is hopefully sending a, not sending, but hopefully um, using one of these new 30 meter telescopes to better chemically study this world. And what I mean here is different molecules absorb and reflect light differently. And while the future 30 meter telescopes that are being built will only see Pluto at best with 30 kilometer per pixel resolutions, and it will probably be more like 50 kilometer per pixel resolutions. What those telescopes will have that New Horizons didn't have is a whole myriad of different instruments that are capable of studying Pluto in different types of spectral analysis, studying more molecules, more chemistry. And chemistry is, well, one of the things that we need to better understand about Pluto. Anyways, I have now prattled on for almost 30 minutes. And in an hour and a half, we are going to be bringing you Astronomy Cast. So I'm going to end my um, conversation about Pluto here and say I'm now going to look and see what questions you have and see if I can answer them. 
Now, while you type those questions in, I'm going to go ahead and remind you to please, please, please um, use the circle with um, a purple star in the center to mark where your questions are. And um, while you type them in, I'm going to say that this has been The Daily Space. I am Dr. Pamela Gay. And I have been your host for today. I, along with Annie Wilson, host this channel. And um, we are here to bring you um, all that is new in space and astronomy. This is a production of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploration of this solar system and beyond. We are produced by Susie Murph. And um, we are brought to you by you, those bits that I'm going to thank you all for in a minute. And yes, Eddie can have some treats. Um, those are what support Susie and Annie's salary. And you may see that we are currently running a um, donation campaign. We are working to try and raise funds for all of our servers for next year. You can donate to us at streamlabs.com slash CosmoQuestX. The donations go to pay for the servers. The bits go to pay for the people. And the bits generate treats for the dogs. Um, and salary for humans, which is really kind of important. Okay, so let me get the sleepy Eddie up. Come over here. Come on up. Nope, nope, nope. Eddie, come over here. Up. Come on. I'm trying to treat him to teach him to come in from the other side. That is such a good boy. Such a good boy. My goal is to eventually get him so that he's willing to sit up here with me. Come here. Come on up. Come on up. He's like, no, I'm afraid to come up. But he's a good boy. Okay. Um, all the science. Let me look and see now what all has happened in the chat. Scrolling up to the top. Um, it would be nice if a flyby craft deployed small orbiters. Yeah, there's lots of different ways to study Pluto. And the question is, what is the best way energetically to do it? Um, it's really kind of challenging to get something in orbit around Pluto because you have to go from, if you get there as quickly as New Horizons got there, you have to go from like 36,000 miles per hour to orbiting. And that's a whole lot of velocity to try and drop. So yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Kick it. Yeah. Um, some days, some days I have all the difficulty. Yes, DPI 209, there is a Cthulhu. They, they um, used lots of uh, dark names because there's dark things and Pluto is, after all, the god of the underworld. They also named features after explorers. Um, thank you, Trekker Kev, for the bits that helped me realize that there was no audio. Um, I'm still working to figure out a wire cast some days. Um... Why are Institute, are you, oh, you're shouting about Bennu because I was using it. Yes, I have a Bennu on my desk that just sort of becomes any rock I need. Oh, binary blaze, the time change. Yes, unfortunately, my dogs are unaware of time changes, so it's been kind of bleak the last couple of mornings. Um... Oh, man. Paranor quoted a uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show, and now I have a brain worm. And now Broken Symmetry is jumping in. And Veronica Cure. I love this chat dearly. 
Um, <laughs> Binary Blaze also has the earworm. Um, looking for more questions. So our instrument asks, can we even call it regolith? Um, I, I don't think with Pluto that we generally refer to things as regolith. Um, we don't know if they have that granule nature. And um, yeah, I, I in the paper that I read this morning, the word regolith I don't think was used. Yes, there is dragon skin terrain. Um, it is a tale of ice and fire. Hello, Hanny's verb. Yes, methane penitentes, um, otherwise known as bladed terrain, because that's much easier to say and to spell. Uh, still looking for questions. Um, There's a really weird noise outside. It sounds like warring dragons, and I can only assume that there's some sort of construction going on down the street. And and broken symmetry, thank you again for the bits. Um, and Trekker Kev, thank you again for the bits. Um, so Journey Started commented, China launched a rocket yesterday. The pictures displayed do not match the mobile rocket launcher that was displayed live when they canceled it. Am I wrong? I don't know Journey Started. That's a binary ablaze question. And um, that may be coming up on Wednesday. I don't know what our and binary ablaze have planned. Okay, Rigel asks, don't Neptune and Pluto swap places as the outer planet at times? And if so, which is currently farther and how often do they swap? Um, I believe that Pluto is currently closer to us than Neptune. And what is happening is Neptune has a round orbit and Pluto has an elliptical orbit. And Pluto's nearest point is nearer to the sign than Neptune and its further point is much further than Neptune. Uh, Neptune in general is embedded inside what's called the Kuiper Belt, which is a belt of icy objects that extends from just inside of Neptune's orbit out to, um, I want to say it goes about 20 times the Earth-Sun distance further than Neptune from the Sun. Oh, the folks in the waffles. My husband actually bought Ego waffles for unknown reasons yesterday. And, and I think I may need to have those for lunch now. Um, hello, the time path. Hello. Um, so DPI has the timing of it for you. Um, I believe it was in 1999, maybe, that Pluto became the inner world. I remember learning about this in fourth grade, um, but unfortunately not everything one learns in fourth grade stays with them until they're 45. Uh... Pluto was closer until 1999. It's now further. I got it backwards. Thank you. And no, they won't ever collide. <laughs> okay. Um, so today there is a lot going on we are going to be attempting again to record this week's astronomy cast today in an hour and 20 minutes we'll be simulcasting it here over on cosmo quest 
Uh, we are going to be talking about, I have all my notes open on my computer upstairs. Can't remember what we're going to be talking about to save my life right now, however, which is why I have notes on my screen upstairs. Um, we meant to record on Friday, however, Fraser's internet decided to go out instead. Um, hopefully things will go better today. We are going to be recording two episodes back to back because this Friday I will be traveling and um, I believe that Annie is going to be covering Daily Space on Friday this week as well. So, um, <laughs> Falco is like, be a good boy. Uh, rescue Pamela's notes. Um, yes, yeah, so weird issues, comets and asteroids are asteroids. Comets are comets, asteroids, and planetary migration. Uh, so hopefully I will see some of you then. And until then, um, thank you all for being here. As always, this has been The Daily Space. We come to you most Mondays through Fridays uh, at... 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, that is 6 p.m. London time, and I think all of the daylight savings time chaos has now been sorted. Uh, we are brought to you by you. Your donations uh, fund our servers for the month of November. We are currently doing a fundraiser to pay for our 2020 AWS reserved instance server fees. Uh, we are looking for $1,447 to cover, well, all the bits and bobs that keep everything going around here. Uh, the bits that you give, those are what get turned into our salaries. And Patreon, as always, is how we fund, um, well, paychecks. So, please, the best way that you can help us long term is to become part of our Patreon. And the reason I say that is because we can give you more in return for what you give us. We can send you transcripts. We can make sure you have quick links in your inbox to everything we do. So please consider following us over on patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. If you want to help us with our servers and it's tax deductible where the law allows, you know what to do streamlabs.com slash CosmoQuestX. Okay, I am done begging. I hate begging, but I like to pay people. I really do. Uh, this has been The Daily Space. We are produced by Susie Murph, and we are a production of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. Wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon, and I'll see you on the other side. Bye-bye.